Hello. Hello. <clears throat> Welcome back my friends. It's obviously time to talk about the books I've read in July. When it comes to books, this month has contained it all. I might have found one of my new all-time favorite books. I've also found books that I'll never read again, ever. Also books that challenge me, that do not challenge me, and a whole lot of surprises. So please follow along this journey. I always talk about the books in the order I read them, and this month is no different. So we'll just start off where I started my July. And that is with the book The History of Bees by Maya Lunde. For those who are especially interested in this one, I made a separate review on my channel, so you can check that one out if you want to. This book may be one of the most successful ones by a Norwegian author in the latest years. It has been translated to a lot of countries and sold a whole lot. Also, this is the first book in what is called the Climate Quartet. So there are supposed to be four books in that series. And the last one is releasing this fall, I think. With the focus on climate change, this book is set on three different locations in the past, future and present. And on all three locations, we meet the beekeepers and their families. And it's written like all of these stories are intertwined. So you jump from story to story from chapter to chapter normally, but this also is altered sometimes. First of all, I ended up really, really liking this novel. I gave it five out of five. And the reason for that is the dystopian part of this novel. That was the story that drove me the whole way through and made me want to get to the next chapter. So the two other chapters I enjoyed and not enjoyed so much, but it didn't matter because I liked the futuristic ones so much and that made me cling on to the story. For each of the stories in the novel you also have this parent-child relationship which is like a side plot to the story. And that made me feel that if this book is ever to be filmatized, I think that would be a good idea. It just felt like a movie in my head. Obviously, climate change is a big part of this novel and it made me reflect on different topics and it talks about different aspects of the climate crisis, which I enjoyed as well. Sometimes it felt a bit forced, but that didn't bother me at all. I think many people could benefit from reading books like this. I've read several people talking about this book as being a bit slow and I didn't think of it before I finished, but after I finished, I sort of, I get it why they can say that. But as I told you in the start, it didn't bother me because of this one story that really engaged me. So yeah, I was happy. So that one I read on my way to a music festival in Belgium. And the next book on this wrap up is the book that I've been wanting to read for a long time, but I thought I'd wait until I was at a festival because that book is also about the festival. And it's Roskilde by Lynn Stumsburg. Roskilde is Scandinavia's biggest music festival and it's set in the town of Roskilde in Denmark. I visited that festival once and I'm very happy I have because it made me orient myself better when I read this novel. Lynn Stonesburg tells us about her experiences with this specific festival and she travels there each year and has been doing that for quite some time. And I would say that she tries to explain why people that goes to festivals like that keep on doing it even though it doesn't make any sense to other people. Also there's a love story intertwined in this novel, which is sort of the plot or the leading line in this novel. I'll be upfront and say that I gave this book five stars, maybe even before I started, which is kind of counterintuitive because often when you have high expectations, they might be crushed. But I read this book in one sitting, sitting in a very, very uncomfortable festival chair in the middle of a noisy, noisy festival ground which I enjoy. And I read about her not sleeping, not finding her friends, the trip to Roskilde, and it was just the perfect time to read this novel. For me, I think this novel was all about how recognizable all the things were, and that someone actually wrote a novel about going to a festival and being miserable, but at the same time wanting to go back. And all the details about how she packs and how she thinks about next year's festival and all that. I know many people like this novel, but it's hard for me as a somewhat hardcore festival goer to talk about it because I'm just such a big fan of all the things she thinks about. It's not necessarily the way it's written. 
it's more about just writing the stuff. I think I will sum it up to if you have liked going to festivals or if you like going to festivals, I think this book definitely is for you. It indeed was for me. With that in mind, I tried to convey that this was kind of a special reading month and the next book also I knew that I would love before I started and this might be one of my new all-time favorite books. And it's Patti Smith with Just Kids. Of course, being a rock and roll icon, she's also now famous for writing books and she's written several of them. And this novel is about her early life and her relationship towards Robert Mapplethorpe. So she writes in her own words a little bit about her childhood, but mostly about her young adult years, abortions and being hungry all the time, not having any money. And she's just written about it in an unsentimental and beautiful way. Before Pat Smith became a rock star, she wrote poems and it really shows in this novel. If I were to describe what I liked about the writing, I think I would say that I liked the cliffhangers on many of the chapters where she spoke about things that were going to happen, but then pulled us back down into the story. I had chills about a dozen times when I read this novel because of course I knew where she was heading and I was so happy when things started going her way. But at the same time, they never really did in this novel. It's not like the big epiphany and then bang, you're famous sort of thing. I'm a fanboy and it's just hard not to like it. You all know that language interpretation isn't my thing, but I've always thought about the quality of Patti Smith's lyrics because they always have some meaning to them and that made me maybe focus more on the language in this book. Also one aspect of this book I really enjoy is the talk about art in general and their relationship to it and how they experiment with different art forms. It's just a thing I enjoy reading about so they couldn't really go wrong. People who like New York also says that this book is just the perfect description of how New York was in the 70s. And I know a little bit more about that place now after I've read this book, but that wasn't really the most important thing to me. Even though I find it extremely hard to talk about how much I really enjoyed this book, this is going to be one of my all time favorite books, I guess. So thank you mom for the recommendation. Maybe some of you know the feeling when you've read three books in a row that you all gave five stars, then you have to choose a book you don't really like at all. And for me, that's Kim Leine with The Prophets of Eternal Fjord. I listened to this on audiobook and it's in line with my new strategy of listening to the longer books and reading the shorter ones. Not really a strategy, but I've done that sometimes now. It's about this Danish Norwegian priest traveling to Greenland in the 1700s and he meets things he's not prepared for. Greenland was a Danish colony and this book reflects that that wasn't always a great relationship. And this story sort of builds on that. The people traveling from Denmark to Greenland not being greeted with a hooray, thank you for coming here. I've seen some interviews with Kim Leine before and he sort of often gets the question of why do you have to be so specific when you describe things and is it important to you to describe things with so many words? And that's also my problem with this book. This book shouldn't have been so girthy. It's the 1700s and people smell and they get infections and these things are apparently very important to write about all the time even though they bear no significance to the story, I would say. Also, it's an epic book, several continents, a lot of years, a lot of pages, but there's not a clear plot. It's rather just, I experienced this, and then I experienced this, and well, I experienced that as well, and then I did this, and then we're finished. I would love to have a big happening in the novel at some time, but I didn't feel like it, even though some things clearly were more important than others. It just didn't lead anywhere for me. I would describe it as a collection of small incidents, but this actually won the Nordic Council Literature Prize, which I've talked a lot about recently. So I was a bit disappointed that it wasn't better. That being said, I know a lot of people that might enjoy this book. If you like things being described a lot and like old historical fiction novels, this is for you, just not for me. So even though I didn't like that Nordic Council Literature Prize winner, I chose to read another one and it's Hotel Silence by Eudur Ava Olafsdottir. 
This novel is about an Icelandic, middle-aged, miserable guy wanting to commit suicide. But instead of committing suicide, he is now traveling to a recent war zone and thinking that if he steps on a landmine, that wouldn't be so bad. And like that introduction may suggest, this is kind of a quirky novel. Our main character is a handyman and he travels to this hotel called Hotel Silence where they have no guests but a lot of problems and he's sort of delaying his suicide by just fixing things at this hotel. To me this ended up being a feel-good novel. I don't know if that's intended but it has to be in some way. I gave this 4 out of 5. The only thing I felt was lacking was kind of the personal close connection with our main character but I don't think the author made any attempts to make me feel that way so that wasn't a problem. I might end up reading this novel again sometime because it was just a beautiful read. Obviously I thought the theme of suicides was a good thing at this moment and I decided to read the book Collective Suicide by Arto Pasalena. I don't think this is translated to English so that's why I did sort of a direct translation. Not sort of, it's directly translated. This is a Finnish novel about two people trying to commit suicide but they tried choosing the same place at once and decided to make a seminar out of it, inviting people that might want to commit suicide. And then a group of these people decide to take a bus ride to commit suicide together. I thought that this was going to be one of my favorite books. I liked it but it wasn't quite there. I laughed out several times, but as with the former one, I didn't actually form a relationship to any of the characters and the fun was all about the collectiveness in the story, about the group thinking and how different they all were and they all had their reasons for wanting to commit suicide, but none of them really stuck and the reason for that is probably that there's many many personal stories in this novel, but there may be too many to make me commit to the novel in a sense. But a lot of funny quotes and a funny book to read and a short one. It made me want to read his most famous book The Year of the Hare so that might be up pretty soon. But that was book number five or six I guess. Obviously I was in a dark place when choosing novels at this point so I decided to read The Plague by Albert Camus. I listened to this on audiobook. It's about a place in North Africa where a plague starts spreading and we get to see how the different people in that place behave around this new situation. I gave this book 1 out of 5 stars and it has all to do with the lack of exciting plot and just immensely boring language. As I told you earlier in this video, I struggle to sometimes talk about language and why it frustrates me, but it's sentences like the narrative now had three data points to describe the situation or something along those lines. Often I felt it was just a bunch of stuck up men talking about this plague and talking about their own importance. If I should guess, I think it's famous for being quite accurate because many of the things described in this novel is at least described in the way I felt the pandemic when it was occurring here. So that's the plus. But I dislike this novel for the language and there is not enough plot in the world to make up for it. I'll leave it at that. Also feels good giving a book one star once in a while, just so I don't get too positive. The next novel is a book that is probably the book that has been with me on most trips the last year in the hopes that I'd start reading it at some point and it's The Remains of the Day by Kazu Ishiguro. The book is set in the 50s and it's about an esteemed estate and its butler. The butler is currently on his first vacation ever I think and he describes the past of the mansion and the two people that have lived there and all the people that have come to visit and all the intrigues. The problem is that I didn't feel like there were too many intrigues. But that didn't matter that much. Ishiguro is famous for talking about things that are not being said and in this novel I felt that very clearly. I made up feelings and stories about the two main characters in my head and I lived happily ever after. I gave this novel 3 out of 5 so it wasn't that happy but it didn't have a lot of plot and for me as a obviously a plot driven reader I 
missed that, but I enjoyed how the main characters communicated and how he reflected on his life. So there were things in this novel that I did enjoy. This is actually my second novel of Ishiguro I've read. I read Never Let Me Go last year and that one was also okay. So I do not know if I'm giving this one up because those have to be the two most famous ones, but time will just tell. If you like underplayed love stories, this one is for you. Also, this book is filmatized and I've thought about the movie before I thought about reading the novel and the two main characters of the movie. I haven't seen it yet, but the two main characters I know who are and I thought about them in my head when I read it. I don't know if that's a plus or minus, but I could imagine if you dislike the casting for the movie and those are the people you have in your head while reading it, that might be a bad thing. And lastly, for my Nordic Council Literature Prize project, I read Detta G by Ingrid Johansen. This is one of the Norwegian contributions, directly translated to This is G. Just a disclaimer, I asked the publisher Oktober Forlag if they would send me a copy, and they did, so thank you for that. The story is told through our narrator, who talks about her parents and grandparents, and relates all their stories to this place called G. And it's all a bit messy, up until halfway through where she talks about herself, her own life and considering selling the place where she grew up or selling parts of it, I'm not quite sure. So this book is far from plot driven and it's not usually the book I would have chosen to read, but I was a bit intrigued because when I read about the author, which I didn't know about from before, people said that she wrote in a very intriguing way and talked about all the everyday stuff in an exciting way. I thought that the first half of this book was really interesting and often she wrote about things that occur in many people's life and it was exciting reading about but then halfway through it just got a bit weird and it got a bit slow. The main character talks about her sister going to knit her a sweater and that takes up a lot of energy. But at the same time, there are so many points in this novel where you're forced to think. It's sentences like G penetrates everywhere. It's a bit out there. You really don't know what she's talking about all the time. And that was kind of an interesting thing about this novel because I sat wondering about what is G really? Is it a place? Is it a person? Is it a state of mind? I have no idea. And these thoughts were with me until halfway through and then I sort of just wondered what all this was about. But then again, maybe I wasn't aware enough to understand what she wrote about in the second half. These are questions I will never get answered and maybe I don't want the answers. But in general, the language of this book is without makeup. So if a person dies, he dies. He doesn't die over 20 pages. And that I really appreciated. Also, I thought I would share a directly translated quote from me. I could have never lived here, said the people in G and shook their heads each time they drove through a landscape or came to a town they've never visited before. I found that quite amusing and I actually laughed a bit when I read this book, which was a total surprise, but a nice one. I think this is one of the novels that will make me think a lot more when I read books going forward. So maybe the fact that I knew that I would review this at some point made me read it slower, but it also felt like the book that you wanted to read slower. And that felt nice. Also, it was quite fun reading this kind of a novel just because I didn't think this one would be for me. And I liked many sides of it, not all, but I'm glad I read it. So that makes up the reads for July. And what a roller coaster ride. I've said that sometimes before, but I mean, one stars, five stars, new future favorites. What can I say? I'm just very happy with my reading at the moment, and I'm looking very much forward to my August reads which is fun. It's a good feeling to have. How have your July reading month been? Have you read more on vacation or less on vacation? I know we're all different in that way, but please comment below if you want to. And if you want to check any of these books out, there will be links in the description. 
and I hope you have a fabulous August and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!